Hey, I'm Sarah, survivor, author, speaker, clarity coach, and I teach women how to get safe, stable, and strong. Right now, I've been having my Jesus bubble, which is where I sit in my bubble chair and have some quiet time that's good for my soul. Would you like to join me? Lately, I've been reading in this book, Hind's Feet on High Places. This is a gorgeous illustrated version of the fabulous allegory about a woman named Much Afraid who is leaving behind all of her feelings, the things that terrify her the most. She's journeying to the high places and her companions, well, they're called sorrow and suffering. She's following the chief shepherd. She wants to experience loving and being loved in its fullest sense. And she wants to be able to move freely without fear in the mountains, rather than living in the Valley of Humiliation. This is episode 10. And today's chapter is called On the Old Seawall. Are you ready to join me? If you have a friend who might like to join us, tag a friend underneath or hit share send it to someone else. And when I'm done, I will drop a link in the comments where you can grab the book if you'd like to read along with me every morning. A few days after, oh no, <laughs> let me start again. A few days had passed after the victory over pride and much afraid and her companions were continuing their journey along the shore of the great sea. One morning, the path unexpectedly turned inland again and they found themselves facing back over the desert in the direction of the mountains, although, of course, they were too far away to be visible. With a thrill of indescribable joy, Much Afraid saw that at last the path actually did run straight toward the east, and it would lead them back to the high places. She dropped the hands of her two guides in order to clap her own and gave a little skip of joy, no matter how great the distance between them and the mountains. Now at last, they were going in the right direction. All three started back across the desert, but Much Afraid could not wait for her guides and actually ran on ahead as though she had never been lame or crippled at all. Suddenly, the path took another turn at right angles and went straight before her as far as she could see, not toward the mountains at all, but southward again, to where far ahead the desert seemed to end in some sort of hill country. Much Afraid stood quite still, dumb with dismay and shock. Then she began to tremble all over. It could not be possible. No, it couldn't. That yet again the shepherd was saying no and turning her right away from the high places. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, said the wise man of long ago, and how truly he spoke. Now she had been skipping and running so excitedly along the path toward the mountains that she had left sorrow and suffering quite behind. And while they were catching up with her, she was standing quite alone at the place where the path turned away from the mountains. Up from behind a sand dune, close beside her, rose the form of her enemy, Bitterness. He did not come any nearer, having learned a little more prudence and was not going to make her call for the shepherd if he could avoid it, but he simply stood and looked at her and laughed and laughed again, the bitterest sound that Much Afraid had heard in all her life. Then, he said, as venomously as a viper, Why don't you laugh too, you little fool? You knew this would happen. There he stood, uttering these awful bursts of laughter, until it seemed that the whole desert was filled with the echoes of his mockery. Sorrow and her sister suffering came up to Much Afraid, and stood beside her by her side quite silently, and for a little while everything was swallowed up in pains and a horror of great darkness. A sudden swirling wind shrieked over the desert and raised a storm of dust and sand which blinded them. In the silence which succeeded the storm, Much Afraid heard her voice, low and trembling, but quite distinct, saying, My Lord, what? Dost thou want to say to me? Speak, for your servant hears. Next moment, the shepherd was standing beside her. Be of good cheer, he said. It is I. Be not afraid. Build me another altar, and lay down your whole will as a burnt offering. 
obediently much afraid raised a little heap of sand and loose stones which was all that she could find in the desert and again laid down her will and said with tears for sorrow had stepped forward and knelt beside her i delight to do your will oh my god from somewhere though they could not see the source there came a spurt of flame which consumed the offering and left a little heap of ashes on the altar then came the shepherd's voice this further delay is not to death but for the glory of god that the son of god may be glorified another gust of wind sprang up and whirled the ashes away in every direction and the only thing remaining on the altar was a rough ordinary looking stone which much afraid picked up and put into the bag with the others then she rose to her feet turned her face away from the mountains and they all started southward the shepherd went with them for a little way so that resentment and self-pity, who were hiding close at hand, awaiting an opportunity to attack, lay flat behind the sand dunes and were not seen at that time at all. Presently they reached a place where the sea, which they had left behind when they turned inland, came sweeping into the desert, forming a great estuary. A strong tide was surging into it, filling it completely with swiftly flowing waters. However, a stone causeway with many arches had been built across the estuary and an earthen ramp led up to it the shepherd led much afraid to the foot of the ramp and told her to follow this path across the sea once more he repeated with great emphasis the words which he had spoken beside the altar and then departed much afraid followed by her two companions scrambled up the ramp and found themselves on top of the old sea wall from the height on which they now stood, they could look back over the desert. On one side was the sea, and on the other, so blurred with distance that they could not be sure if they really saw it, was a haze which might be part of the mountains, or was it only wishful thinking? Then, looking ahead, they saw that the causeway would indeed bring them across the estuary into a different kind of country altogether, a well-wooded land of hills and valleys with cottages and farmsteads among orchards and fields. The sun was shining brilliantly, and up there, on the wall, they could feel the full force of the great wind which was urging and lashing the rushing waves to flow swifter and swifter. It reminded much afraid of a pack of hounds, urged on by the huntsmen, following one another, leaping and surging and roaring beneath the causeway, and then flowing forward, far inland, brimming the shores of the estuary. Somehow, the roar of the wind and the surge of the waters seemed to get into her blood and course through her being like a glorious wine of life. The wind whipped her cheeks and tore at her hair and clothes and nearly toppled her over, but she stood there, shouting at the top of her voice, though the wind seized the sound of it and carried it off, ground in a deafening roar of her own, of its own. What much afraid was shouting up there on the old sea wall was this. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about. Therefore I will sing praises unto the Lord. Yes, I will offer the sacrifice of joy and will praise the name of the Lord. You see that? Isn't it beautiful? As she sang, she thought to herself, it must be really dreadful to be the shepherd's enemies. Always, always to find themselves frustrated always, always to have their prey snatched away. How simply maddening it must be to see even the silliest little weaklings set up out of reach on the high places and made to triumph over all their enemies. It must be unbearable. While still on the causeway, she picked up another stone, as the shepherd had taught her, this time as a memorial of his victory in making her triumph over her enemies, and she dropped it into the little bag of treasured memories. So they made their way across the causeway and down the ramp on the other side and immediately found themselves in a wood. The change in scene after their long journey through the desert was wonderful. A long deferred spring was just loosening everything from the grip of winter and all the trees were bursting into fairest green and the buds were swelling. In between the trees were glades of bluebells and wild anemones and violets and primroses grew in clumps along the mossy banks. Birds sang and called to one another and rustled about, busily absorbed in nest building. Much afraid told herself 
that never before had she realized what the awakening from the death of winter was like. Perhaps it had needed the desert wastes to open her eyes to all this beauty. But she walked through the wood, almost forgetting for a little that Sorrow and her sister also walked with her. Everywhere she looked, it seemed that the unfurling green on the trees and the nesting birds and the leaping squirrels and blossoming flowers were all saying the same thing, greeting one another in their own special language with a sort of ecstasy and calling cheerfully, You see, the winter has gone at last. The delay was not unto death, but for the glory of God. Never was there a fairer spring than this. At the same time, much afraid herself, was conscious of a wonderful stirring in her own heart, as though something were springing up and bringing into new life, breaking into new life there too. The feeling was so sweet, yet so mixed with pain, that she hardly knew which predominated. She thought of the seed of love which the shepherd had planted in her heart, and, half afraid and half eager, she looked to see if it had really taken root and was springing up. She saw a mass of leaves, and at the end of the stem, a little swelling which might almost prove to be a bud. As much afraid looked at it, another stab went through her heart, for she remembered the words of the shepherd that when the plant of love was ready to bloom, she would be left in return and would receive a new name, up there, on the high places. But here she was, still far away from them, indeed farther than ever before, and with apparently no possibility of going there for a long time to come. How could the shepherd's promise prove true? When she thought of that, her tears fell again. You may think that Much Afraid was altogether too much given to shedding tears, but remember that she had sorrow for a companion and teacher. There is this to be added, that her tears were all in secret, for no one but her enemies knew about this strange journey on which she had set out. The heart knows its own sorrow, and there are times when, like David, it is comforting to think that our tears are put in a bottle and not one of them is forgotten by the one who leads us through paths of sorrow. But she did not weep for long, for almost at once she caught sight of something else, a gleam of gold. Looking closer, what could she see but an exact replica of the little golden flower she had found growing near the pyramids in the desert? Somehow it had been transplanted and was actually growing in her own heart. Much Afraid gave a cry of delight, and the tiny golden thing nodded and said in its little golden voice, Behold me, here I am, growing in your heart, acceptance with joy. Much Afraid smiled and answered, Why, yes, of course, I was forgetting. And she knelt down there in the wood, put a pile of stones together, and laid sticks on them. As you have noticed, altars are built of whatever materials lie close at hand at the time. Then she hesitated. What should she lay on the altar this time? She looked at the tiny swelling on the plant of love, which might be a bud and again might not. And then she leaned forward, placed her heart on the altar, and said, Behold me, here I am, your little handmaid, and acceptance with joy, and all that is in my heart is yours. This time, though there was a flame and fire, though there came a flame of fire and burned up the sticks, the bud was still on the stem of the plant. Perhaps that much afraid, because it was too small to offer. But nevertheless, something lovely had happened. It was as though a spark from the flame had entered her heart and was still glowing there, warm and radiant. On the altar among the ashes was yet another stone for her to pick up and put with the rest. So now there were six stones of remembrance lying in the little bag she carried. Going on their way, in a very short time, they came to the edge of the wood, and she uttered a cry of joy, for who should be standing there waiting to meet them but the shepherd himself? She ran toward him, as though she had wings on her feet. Oh, welcome, welcome, a thousand times welcome, cried Much Afraid, tingling with joy from head to foot. I am afraid there is nothing much in the garden of my heart as yet, shepherd, but all that there is, it is yours. I came to bring you a message, said the shepherd. You are to be ready, much afraid, for something new. This is the message. Now you will see what I will do. Exodus chapter 6, verse 1. 
The color leaped into her cheeks, and a shock of joy went through her, for she remembered the plant in her heart and the promise that when it was ready to bloom, she would be up on the high places and ready to enter the kingdom of love. Oh, shepherd, she exclaimed, almost breathless with the thought, do you really mean that I am ready to go to the high places, really, at last? She thought he nodded, but he did not answer at once. He stood looking at her with an expression she did not quite understand. Do you mean it? she repeated, catching his hand and looking up at him with almost incredulous joy. You will soon be taking me to the high places? This time he answered, yes, and added with a strange smile, now you will see what I will do. Now, today is Friday, so we'll start again next Monday with our next chapter, The Great Precipice Injury. I wonder what that will be. I'm curious if you have been following along. Have you written down any of these altar stones, these memorials for yourself? Now Much Afraid has six of them. I know for me, there have been times where I have recognized that this is a marker. This is a milestone of something God is doing. This is a moment that stands out. In the Old Testament, they called them an Ebenezer, an altar built that marks a milestone in your journey. So what are those for you? What have you been experiencing where either God has called you and you realize you are laying down something big on the altar or it's a moment where God has provided something or taught you a lesson and you've realized something and it is a, a memory moment, a milestone marker. What are those for you? Have you written them down? Have you journaled about those? Have you talked to friends, your therapist maybe, even your older children, and shared what God has done for you? It can be really beautiful to share these experiences together. And if you're stumbling along in your journey on the other side, or maybe still in the middle of experiencing trauma, betrayal, abuse, recovery, I'd love to work with you. We can work together in my group coaching club. It's called The Scoop. And it is the most affordable group coaching that is for trauma recovery you'll find, I think, pretty much anywhere. I'll drop a link underneath. I'd love to see you. Feel free to just drop me a message if you'd like to find out more. And I will see you next time.